Welcome everyone to GLS Station 2 on Head Injury. This is just a short mini lecture um, to help you with answering the questions uh, on, on the GLS station. So the learning objectives, um, the first two, the components of GCS and basal skull fracture signs has been covered pretty much in the main lecture where, where we had the case about Angus. Um, but this little, this short mini lecture is going to cover subdural, extradural and subarachnoid bleeds the clinical signs of herniation and how the Munro kelly doctrine helps us understand those signs, and then briefly looking at neuroprotective strategies to prevent secondary brain injury. So just a brief comment about GCS. Um, the left versus right side of the body can have different GCS scores, because if you imagine, if you've had a traumatic bleed and you've, had, you've got signs of a stroke, and you're weak down one side, if you do a motor response for the GCS on the left compared to the right, you'll have a differing um, result. So it's important to, to really just document which side of the body you're doing when you're doing the GCS. Also, um, the lowest GCS you can get is three, even if you're dead. So if someone comes up to you and says, Doctor, come, come, the patient has a GCS of zero, then you know you have to go really fast to see the patient because the person looking after them has no idea what they're talking about. Um, another thing is GCS8 is when you should be worried that the patient's airway is compromised and that um, the patient might need intubation. So GCS8 is, a, is the cutoff point. Uh, toxicology. So GCS was... Uh, created for trauma patients, created in Glasgow, but now we use it for any patient with a reduced level of consciousness, including patients who've taken a drug overdose. So it's important that with patients with a drug overdose, often their IA score and their verbal score can be lower than what you would expect, and that can give a, a GCS that is skewed to a lower result. So if you just use the motor score alone, in patients in tox with uh, drug overdoses, that's a, a lot more useful um, in determining their, their level of consciousness. So, traumatic intracranial hemorrhage. There's three main types I want you guys to understand, and that's extradural, subdural, and subarachnoid bleeds. And this diagram, if you can get your head around this concept, it'll help understand, help you understand those three types of bleeds. So if you think of, uh, remember the meninges, there's three layers, the pia matter, the arachnoid, and the dura matter. And I remember this as PAD, so the, menin the meninges pad the brain. So an extradural bleeds between the skull and the dura. So it's in this space here. Whereas a subdural is beneath the dura, and it's between this arachnoid layer and the dural layer. And a subarachnoid is in this space in between the arachnoid and the pia matter. So this is where those three bleeds occur. And this is another diagram that shows the same thing. Extradurals in between this space, subdurals in between this space, and subarachnoid in the subarachnoid space. This is a great diagram, I think, which summarizes epidural so epidural, the other name for that is extradural. So don't get confused. Extradural, epidural are the same. And this green layer is your dura. So if you get a bleed in here, usually an arterial bleed, that will peel off the dura in this extradural space. And this is usually an arterial bleed. Whereas a subdural bleed, see how the dura is still intact, but this subdural space between the arachnoid and the um, dura. This is usually from venous bleeding. Okay. Um, great. So let's move on. This table summarizes everything nice and clearly for you. So an extradural bleed, the mechanism is usually a high speed impact, like a motor vehicle accident or a baseball bat to the side of the head. It's often young um, patients. The symptoms uh, loss of consciousness, acute loss of consciousness, and often they'll wake up, get to the emergency department awake, and then as the artery 
stops being in vasospasm, then you get an acute deterioration again, a second phase, a second loss of consciousness, and then you know you're in trouble, and they'll need urgent neurosurgery. Uh, the CT characteristics we'll have a look at in the next few slides, but it's a, it's a lens shape or almond shape bleed. Subdurals are often low impact, often like a fall from height, and these are usually your older people with shrunken brains, and their symptoms uh, can be over a few days, so they might be a little bit confused for a few days, and then after a week become drowsy as the bleed uh, increases. And the shape of this is usually a concave or like a, a banana-shaped bleed on CT. Subarachnoids, again, are often high impact, acute onset of symptoms, and it's usually bleeding from capillaries or arterioles in the subarachnoid space. And the bleeding pattern is quite different. I'll show you a CT of that. And the age can be old, young, or anywhere in between. So this is your extradural or epidural bleeds. You can see it's got this characteristic biconcave almond-shaped shape to it. And it's often a cut of the middle meningeal artery that results in this arterial bleed. So you'll often get a skull fracture associated with this. This is your subdural. See how it's a concave shape that traverses, can traverse the entire side of, of the brain. And uh, this is often from ruptured bridging veins. Now you'll see there are suture lines, you know, as a, as a baby, you have, you know, different sutures of the different plates of the head as they're the, the brain is fusing, the, the plates of the brain are fusing, and subdural bleeds do not get limited by those suture lines. Whereas your extradural bleeds, because of the way the dura invaginates or creeps into those suture line spaces, that stops your extradural bleeds from crossing over. So this would be like a suture line here that stops the, the blood from traversing. Subarachnoid bleeds, this is actually one of the most common CT abnormalities you'll see. And up to 50% of severe traumatic brain injuries will have a subarachnoid component. And if you look here, see how the white goes deep down into the sulci? That's your classic subarachnoid appearance. So remember, your sulci are these deep crevices, and the gyrus or gyri are the kind of the mountain parts of, of the cortex. Okay, Munro-Kelly doctrine. It's quite a simple concept that the skull is a rigid container and in that container there's non-compressible contents, brain tissue, blood and CSF. So if you increase the volume of another, like another bleed in that fixed container, then one of these other things has to give. So if you see an increasing, so this bleed in here, it has, when that increases, CSF and venous blood gets pushed out of the brain. And as the bleed increases in size, eventually you're going to get brain tissue pushing down um, into the brain stem, out the foramen magnum. And that is called herniation. So this is your um, uncle herniation. This is the uncus, the lower part of the cortex, which can push down over the tentorium cerebelli and that's called uncle herniation. And then you can get uh, tonsillar herniation, which is a lot uh, you know, more life-threatening, where it, the brain stem and the, the brain is being pushed down the foramen magnum. So once you get brain parenchyma getting pushed out of the skull, that's called herniation. And eventually you get compression of the brain stem, which results in bradycardia, hypertension, apnea, and death. So... Going on from herniation, there's certain clinical signs that can be, you know, a red flag to you as the clinician to say, hey, this patient is deteriorating rapidly and has got raised intracranial pressure. And one of the first things is if they drop their GCS by two points, that can be a very important red flag that they're getting signs of herniation. Eye signs, they can get a dilated pupil. And the way this works, if you look at this diagram here, this is your uncus getting pushed over the tentorium cerebelli, which is this um, kind of bone cartilage structure here. And if you look here, this is your oculomotor nerve. 
This passes right beside the uncus. So in uncle herniation, the first thing that gets compressed is your ocular motor nerve. And that results in your pupil being dilated. And you get a, you know, a unilateral dilated pupil. Then you can get heart signs, like your Cushing's triad, as the brain stem gets compressed. And um, as the midbrain and pons gets compressed, you get dystonic posturing, um, decorticate and decerebrate posturing. And then you can get your hemiparesis and seizures at the end stage. I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, but your ocular motor nerve has your sphincter pupillae, levator palpebrae, this muscle here, and most of your extraocular muscles. So when you paralyze the third nerve, you get ptosis, dilation of the pupil, and your down and out syndrome. Um, decorticate posturing. If you get compression of the midbrain here, you get decorticate uh, flexion of the arms. And then as you constrict or compress the pons, then you get your decerebrate posturing. So you usually get decorticate, then decerebrate. So first I caught the cat with your arms flexed, and then you drop the cat. And so decerebrate posturing happens next, after decorticate. Management of traumatic brain injury. There's a few extra slides in the um, lecture notes that goes onto this, but once the damage is done, primary injury, there's not a lot you can do. But what we try to do in the hospital is to do neuroprotective strategies. And the idea of that is we're trying to increase the mean arterial pressure and reduce the intracranial pressure. And this is what we call the cerebral perfusion pressure. And that's what approximates your cerebral blood flow because you can't directly measure cerebral blood flow very, very easily. So we use the cerebral perfusion pressure as a way of estimating cerebral blood flow. So chisel, take the collar off, that reduces or uh, increases venous return. Avoid hypotension and hypoxia. Intubate and hyperventilate to protect their airway. So again, this is for severe head injury, patients with a GCS of eight or less. The three S's, seizure, seizure prevention with anticonvulsant medications give hypertonic saline or mannitol to again draw fluid out of the brain and reduce cerebral edema and sedate the patient to avoid them moving. Elevate the head to increase venous drainage and as a last resort um, if they're still deteriorating you're probably going to need neurosurgery. And that is the end of the mini lecture. Enjoy your questions.